Rules Committee come to order and thank you very much for joining us this afternoon for another fun Rules Committee meeting today. The Rules Committee will be considering H.R. 38, the Concealed Carry Reciprocity Act of 2017. Conflicting state codes and regulations have created a patchwork of reciprocity agreements for concealed carry permit holders. As a result, citizens with a state-issued concealed carry permit from a state that does not require a permit can lose their Second Amendment rights when entering another state if that state may have different rules and regulations. The Concealed Carry Reciprocity Act, Reciprocity Act ensures that law-abiding citizens' Second Amendment rights do not end when they cross state lines. The facts show that citizens who carry a concealed handgun are not only better prepared to act on their own self-defense, but also in defense of others. The legislation under consideration today also includes the Fix NICS Act, a bipartisan bill to ensure that federal and state authorities comply with existing law and support criminal history records to the National Instant Criminal Background Check System, known as NICS. The legislation penalizes federal agencies that fail to report relevant criminal records to the FBI, and it incentivizes states to improve their reporting and directs federal funding to make sure domestic violence records are actually reported to the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The bill also contains a study on bump stocks that requires the Bureau of Justice Statistics to report to Congress within 180 days on the number of times that a bump stock has been used in commission of a crime in the United States. Without objection, I'd like to welcome the two distinguished gentlemen here today, one from Virginia, the gentleman, the young chairman, Chairman Goodlad, as well as the gentleman from New York, Congressman Nadler, and the gentlewoman uh, from Texas, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, who I have not seen yet, but we will include her on this first panel. We're delighted to have each of you here at the Rules Committee to discuss this important legislation. Without objection, anything you brought in writing will be in the record. However, before we come to each of you, we're going to defer for any opening statement, the gentlewoman from New York, the ranking member, like I would, I would like to make. Gentlewoman, sorry. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Yes, ma'am. Well, as we mark the holiday season, I don't think the American people have a lot to be celebrating today, and particularly this bill today. Under the leadership of the majority, the Congress is unable to fulfill its most basic task. Funding for the government expires in three days, but there are no guarantees that you'll be able to keep the lights on despite unified control of the House, the Senate, and the White House. This committee was scheduled to consider a two-week continuing resolution today, which was pulled from the agenda later this morning. There's never been a time when the government shut down with one party controlling all the levers of power in Washington, but it looks like we'll make history we could this week for all the wrong reasons. Important initiatives like the Children's Health Insurance Program, Community Health Centers, National Flood Insurance Program, the Perkins Loans have all expired. We can't get a vote on the DREAM Act and Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, FISA, is due to expire at the end of the month. With so many issues before us, I think it is particularly galling that the majority has handed the gun lobby a pen to write a bill we are considering today that would make our communities even less safe from gun violence. It was just a month ago tomorrow that a man with a gun went into a church in a small Texas town, killed 26 people, including an 18-month-old baby. He also wounded 20 more. One family lost eight of its cherished members. Think of that. Those killed in the attack equaled about 7% of the small town's entire population. This is not the time for Congress to allow dangerous people to carry a gun all across the country without regard to state laws. Yet under the bill we are considering today, violent offenders and people with no firearm safety training would be able to carry hidden, loaded handguns, even if they could not otherwise legally purchase a gun in that state. Let's be honest with the American people about its effects. If this bill passes, Violent offenders with loaded handguns could be coming into a community near you, even if you reside in a state with tough gun laws. Groups like the Major Cities Police Chief Association, the Police Foundation, the Police Executive Research Forum all oppose concealed carry legislation. 
And H.R. 38 goes even further than a similar bill in the Senate. Now, hear this, because it exposes members of law enforcement, law enforcement, to personal litigation if by mistake they question someone's ability under the law to have a gun. Don't you think that's going a little far? Does the majority really want to make the members of law enforcement the law enforcement afraid to do their jobs? It is appalling that this NRA bill is being combined with a separate bipartisan bill to improve background checks in response to the shooting in Texas. This is simply sabotage. A bipartisan bill to improve the national instant criminal background check system would pass overwhelmingly, not only in the House, but also in the Senate. But a combined concealed carry bill may not have the 60 votes it needs to pass on the other side of the Capitol. Every day in America, 93 people on average are killed with a gun. There have been close to 1,000, 1,000 mass shootings since Sandy Hook, where three or more people have lost their lives. Our communities are being torn apart, whether it's a church, a movie theater, a concert, a school, or the threat of gun violence is there with us. And let's remember, too, that very recently we had the massacre in Las Vegas. There are no sanctuaries from gun violence in America. 16 of America's top retired military commanders, including General McChrystal, just this week are pleading with Congress to do something about gun violence. They don't want military weapons being used on America's streets. But sadly, their pleas and those of the people that we represent are being ignored because of the NRA. Thank you, and I yield back. Ms. Slaughter, thank you very much for your remarks. I will tell you that I called Mrs. Slaughter before this hearing today and uh, asked uh, her for her uh, help in making sure that we were precise in doing what we wanted to do. And I assured her and she assured me that there would be a fair fight today. That's a fair fight be, every day. Should be Well, it is but, when you're involved. Well, I, I, that's, and you as well. But I told her yes, that for well, sure. I told you I was going to talk about guns. Yes, ma'am, you did. Right. And, and I, and I did. Up. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, we're delighted that you're here. Uh, <clears throat> the young chairman's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, chairman Sessions, Ranking Member Slaughter, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today in support of H.R. 38, the Concealed Carry Reciprocity Act of 2017. H.R. 38 was introduced by Mr. Hudson of North Carolina and is co-sponsored by 213 members from both sides of the aisle. This bill allows law-abiding gun owners with valid state-issued concealed firearm permits or those who live in so-called constitutional carry states to carry a concealed firearm in any other state that also allows concealed carry. Studies show that carrying concealed weapons reduces violent crime rates by deterring would-be assailants and by allowing law-abiding citizens to defend themselves. A 1997 study published by John Lott and David Mustard Regarding the effect of concealed carry laws on crime rates, estimated that when state concealed handgun laws went into effect in a county, murders fell by more than 7% and rapes and aggravated assaults fell by similar percentages. This bill simply allows Americans who travel in interstate commerce to take their Second Amendment right with them, which is what the founders intended. I also, I'm also pleased that this bill is being paired with H.R. 4477, the Fix Nix Act, of 2017. This bipartisan and bicameral bill, Mr. Chairman, was introduced by two of the now absent chairman's Texas delegation colleagues, Mr. Culberson and Mr. Cuellar. The Fix Nix Act takes steps to ensure that state and federal agencies enter <laughs> all relevant records into the <coughs> FBI's National Instant Background Criminal Background Check System, or Nix. This bill will help ensure people who are legally prohibited from having guns do not get them. The church shootings in Charleston, South Carolina and Sutherland Springs, Texas are tragic reminders of what can happen when all relevant records are not entered into the system. 
Our NIC system is only as good as the information within it. This important piece of legislation will ensure that the information is complete and up to date. Taken together, these two bills preserve and protect the right guaranteed to us by the Second Amendment and ensure that those prohibited by law from receiving a firearm are prevented from doing so. These are principles that every member of Congress should enthusiastically support. Again, I thank you for your time and look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. The gentleman from New York is now recognized for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appear today in opposition to H.R. 38, the Concealed Carry Reciprocity Act, because this bill would not protect us from gun violence, but would instead make us far less safe. Under current law, each state makes its own determination about who may carry a concealed firearm in public, including deciding which other states concealed carry permits to recognize. This bill would eviscerate the core public safety determinations that each state makes concerning the concealed carrying of guns in public based on the unique circumstances in each state and the desires of its citizens. In fact, the standards and requirements adopted in the states vary dramatically. 31 states and the District of Columbia require gun safety training to carry concealed guns in public. And 21 of those states require live fire training. 27 states and D.C. prohibit individuals convicted of misdemeanor crimes of violence from concealed carry. 28 states and D.C. prohibit convicted stalkers from carrying concealed weapons. 34 states and D.C. prohibit those under 21 years of age from carrying concealed guns. Many states prohibit gun possession and concealed carry by abusive dating partners, exceeding federal protections that extend only to abusive spouses. All of these states would have their carefully considered laws governing car concealed carry overridden by this amendment. The obvious solution to the varying state laws is to continue to do what is currently done by many states, which is to choose which other state permits they will recognize. Some states, including my state of New York, have chosen not to recognize permits issued by any other state. Most states, however, have chosen to recognize permits from at least some other states, basing the choice on the strength of the standards employed by the other states. We should not disregard these determinations, which is what this bill would do. I would also point out one other thing. There are bills that we see every session, some of which make sense, some of which don't, to override state standards and to substitute federal standards in a given area. But that's not what this bill would do. This bill is a very unusual kind of bill in that it would use federal power to import the laws of one state into the laws of another state. It wouldn't impose a uniform federal law. It would simply say that New Jersey is governed by the law of whichever other state it may be. I don't know of any other laws that import the law, that use federal power to import the laws of one state into another state. Although I, although I can think of a bill that did, a, a formal law, the Fugitive Slave Act. Although I oppose the concealed carry reciprocity provisions of this bill, I submitted an amendment to this committee to address one of the concerns I just mentioned. More than half of states recognize that individuals guilty of violent misdemeanors, violent misdemeanors, although not as serious as felonies, have a greater propensity for future criminal activity and therefore will not allow such persons to carry concealed guns. My amendment would prevent the bill from forcing these states to recognize the concealed carry permits of states that do not have prohibitions with respect to people who have been convicted of violent misdemeanors. I do not believe we should consider this bill on the floor without consideration of this amendment and allowing floor debate on the many others that my colleagues have submitted to address similar serious flaws with the bill. In addition, I am deeply disappointed that the version of the bill before the Rules Committee today includes the bipartisan Fix Nix Act, a measure that should be enacted as a standalone bill without delay. That bill would take steps to address shortcomings with the National Instant Criminal Background Check System, or what we often call the Nix. As the recent mass shooting at the church in Sutherland Springs, Texas illustrates, we should do more to ensure all relevant prohibiting Records are submitted to the databases that comprise the NICS. No one should pass the firearms background check that he or she should have failed simply because their record of a felony conviction or domestic violence record or some other prohibition under federal law was not included in the system. There is broad bipartisan support for the fixed NICS bill here in the House and in the Senate. That proposal, which actually would save lives, should not be tethered to the forced concealed carry reciprocity provisions of H.R. 38, which would only serve to endanger our citizens. Unfortunately, the harms of the concealed carry reciprocity portion of the bill being considered 
taken to the floor, being taken to the floor outweigh the benefits of the Nix improvements. Therefore, I oppose the combined bill and urge the committee to reject it. However, that does not mean that the many thoughtful and substantive amendments that my colleagues and I have submitted to address the concealed carry provision should not be considered on the floor. I therefore ask that if the bill is made in order, those amendments be made in order so that we may debate this critical public policy issue in a comprehensive manner. I thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you very much. I want to thank both of you not only for taking your time to be here today, but for your uh, comments. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I will tell you that I'm a lifetime member of the National Rifle Association. I've tried to pay attention very carefully to uh, the attributes of uh, crime in this country. As you know, I have a, some background with my family being in law enforcement and have believed that where you have a police officer or an armed citizen, you stand a chance to stop perpetrators who would uh, commit crimes. And when they do, you have a chance to protect yourself, your family, and loved ones. And I believe that this bill, in, it, in, in its very essence, is to make sure that law-abiding citizens who believe in the United States of America uh, and the Constitution would not find themselves in trouble as long as they are following the law. And I appreciate you bringing this bill forward today, and I want to thank you very much. Chairman Colt. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I actually just want to associate myself with your remarks. Uh, well said. I'm an NRA member, so uh, our sentiments are similar on that. And uh, I want to thank the chairman for working on the legislation. Certainly thank you. I do have one question, though, uh, real quickly. On the, the bump stock issue, um, we clearly have a technology that makes a legal product an illegal product. I think all of us were surprised to find that out. Mm. And as I looked into it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Chairman, that was a decision made by the, the uh, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms people, actually during President Obama's administration. I'm kind of surprised at the decision. Surprised. Is, is our aim here to get them to rethink that decision? Because this clearly ought to be something that's outlawed, in my view. Well, absolutely. And I share your concern about the, the misuse of uh, the, these uh, devices that can turn uh, a, a semi-automatic weapon into something that is like uh, an automatic weapon. Uh, so we, th we view this as the first step in gathering more information about it. Is this used in crimes? Uh, obviously, uh, it appears to have been used in the uh, very serious crime in Las Vegas. Uh, are there other instances? Uh, and we continue to work with the ATF on uh, what is the best way to go about preventing that from happening. And the study that's called for as a part of this legislation is directed at that, uh, but I believe I, I share your concern that we may need to do more. Okay, well, I think, uh, gentleman from New York. Yes, uh, I want to make two comments. Uh, we know I, I agree with you totally that uh, the sole function of the so-called bump stock is to uh, make an automatic is to make a semi-automatic weapon operate like an automatic weapon. We have banned automatic weapons in this country since the 1930s. I don't think we need a study. This bill provides for study. As far as I'm concerned, that's just a delaying device. We ought to be banning the use of these bumps, bump stocks, whatever they, these bump stocks immediately uh, because they have no function other than to get around the law, to get around the law that, that no one disputes. I, I don't think there's anybody who, I shouldn't say nobody, probably there are not too many people who advocate uh, legalizing machine guns and, and automatic weapons, and this, that's what this does in effect. So we ought to eliminate it uh, automatically. I just want to comment also on one thing Mr. Mr. Sessions says, and I think it's the underlying, uh, there, there are two underlying problems with this bill. One is the basic problem that we're all talking about. But the other is that uh, this bill, as I said before, doesn't make a standard. What it does, and it doesn't make a judgment, what it does is to, is to import, is to use federal power to import the law of any state into a different state and to deprive the people of that state of the ability to make that judgment. And that is simply wrong as a matter of federalism, uh, not to mention a matter of prudence. Uh, the second thing I wanted to say with respect to what Mr. Sessions said is that guns, we've run this experiment now for 40 or 50 years. And you look at the statistics, and I don't know exactly, but more or less, 
The United Kingdom has 146 people killed by guns each year. Japan, 75. Other countries in the double or triple digits. The United States, 30,000. We are not thousands of times more mentally ill than the Germans or the British or the Japanese. Uh, that would be a slander on the American people. Um, the frequency of death by guns is directly correlated, and this has been shown, by the availability of guns in society. And um, you can say that uh, the, 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 if someone has a gun, uh, you know, law-abiding citizen with a gun will stop a person without a gun. And on occasion, that will be true. Uh, will stop a, person, a bad guy with a gun. On occasion, that will be true. On occasion, the good guy will shoot the wrong person. I'd hate to see a shootout between good and bad people in a subway in New York City, for example. Um, but speaking as a whole, there is no question that you can correlate the presence of guns in society, the, the availability of guns in society, directly with the homicide rate by guns. And again, how do you explain no other country in the world has a homicide rate by gun exceeding 200, 250, and we do 30,000 a year. Uh, Mr. Vice Chair, if I might uh, make two points. First of all, with regard to your point, with regard to bump stocks, uh, I think we're already having an effect because the Department of Justice just today put out a press release announcing that they are uh, reopening the rulemaking process with regard to devices like bump stocks. Uh, Justice Department and ATF begin regulatory process to determine whether bump stocks are prohibited. So uh, that is a positive development that I think is very directly related to the legislation that we have before us. Secondly, with regard to the comments from my uh, friend from New York, uh, the fact of the matter is that the Second Amendment is a, a constitutional right that extends to all Americans. And the Supreme Court has held uh, that it extends to them for the purpose of self-defense, uh, and that it extends uh, to uh, their right to exercise that in all of the states. So I would hate to see states make it more difficult for people to exercise that right. Uh, and it is the federal government that has the responsibility of determining uh, how one can transport uh, a firearm across state lines. So I think that's uh, an appropriate thing. And the people who are allowed to do this, uh, the statistics, uh, are very, very strong that these are very, very law-abiding people <laughs> uh, and I agree with Chairman Sessions that their, their presence uh, will help to fight crime and prevent crime and uh, be very, very unlikely that it's going to uh, create additional crimes. I think just the opposite is going to be the case. So thank I, you. I thank both of you. I actually want, only wanted to ask about the one thing, but I think we got a, a telling glimpse of what will be a very eloquent debate. So uh, thank you very much. You'll back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I noticed that now Ms. Jackson Lee has uh, had an opportunity to come here. We, we got started a little bit. Uh, under the auspices, Ms. Jackson Lee, that you would be allowed to provide testimony on this first panel. As you know, we're attempting to uh, run rather quickly today as a result of the uh, obligations of the House and this evening. The uh, gentlewoman uh, has been provided the protection of anything she brought in, in writing would be entered in the record. Without objection, we will continue that. The gentlewoman is recognized. Thank you, and I thank the Rules Committee for its courtesies, uh, slaughter sessions. Um, I think my colleagues have probably uh, very well uh, spoken. Uh, let, let me just um, speak to the um, issue of um, where we are. Uh, I um, think that we've done a lot together on the Judiciary Committee, though we are sometimes charged without having a collaborative effort. But last week, these bills were separated. And the, NC, the NIC bill was a bipartisan bill. Uh, if I might use the term that it would, could could have rolled to the House uh, and had a bipartisan vote of support. Even though it is legislation that I would want to be stronger, uh, it does provide uh, funding uh, to improve that background check system, which can save lives. Uh, in a matter of uh, overnight magic, uh, the uh, concealed bill, concealed weapons bill reciprocity is merged with NICS. And I think, uh, in all honesty, uh, that is trickery and unfair. Uh, and um, uh, it is well known uh, that um, Democrats, in many instances, have an opposition to an unwieldy, um, unrestrained use of guns 
uh, and therefore the uh, reciprocity bill was going to be a real problem. We spent most of the day amending it, uh, and so I, I'm baffled as to how all of a sudden it was so urgent to merge the two bills. We finished today. We have a holiday party, I understand, uh, but this could have been done um, in the, the days to come. So I'm very unhappy about this. This National Instant Criminal Background Check um, is an important act. Uh, it can stand on its own two feet. This bill aims to improve the submissions of information by federal and state agencies to NICS and serves as a response to the recent Sutherland, Texas massacre where it was revealed that the Air Force had failed to submit the domestic violence court martial record of the shooter, um, Devin Kelly. Uh, so I have an amendment that would go to uh, this legislation and I will not um, take a long time, but um, this is amendment number uh, 229, and it would be amending the NICS bill, uh, and it would go through requiring the Secretary of Defense shall conduct a comprehensive review of the procedures used by each branch of the armed forces to submit to the Attorney General records which are relevant to a determination of whether a person is disqualified. So it would have a more extensive review um, disqualified from possessing or receiving a firearm, which did not happen with the uh, perpetrator, now deceased, who killed um, uh, 10 scores of, of individuals, uh, 20 people plus, uh, in Sutherland, uh, Texas. And um, everyone was appalled. They were appalled at the violence that he exhibited against his wife. Um, but here he is, armed to the teeth, uh, and in some extended way, in the relative of his wife, or his present wife, or ex-wife, <coughs> here he is at a church worshiping. So I'd ask my colleagues to support that amendment that deals with the uh, armed services, and I'd ask for a waiver. If it is proven to be non-germane, I ask for a waiver, because it's important enough, just as uh, we must have sought some kind of trickery to merge the two bills. Uh, as it relates to uh, the reciprocity bill, uh, let me be very clear. I work with a lot of law enforcement, as I guess all of us do. Uh, but having been on the Judiciary Committee for a long time, I have engaged with all of my chiefs of police and all the federal offices in my district. And there are a lot of them, as there are in others. But from the FBI to DEA, we've done uh, projects together dealing with trying to ensure the safety of my community. And I work extensively with almost every single chief uh, that has been the chief uh, during the time that I've served, including uh, uh, former mayor and chief Lee Brown, uh, who is the father of community-oriented policing, first woman police chief, and now the first Hispanic police chief. But they have all been uh, members of the Major Chiefs Association. And the Major Chiefs Association, I think, are unique because they are responsible for their men and women. They're responsible for those who patrol the streets. And they are absolutely appalled. I will later submit in the record a letter from the Chiefs of Police. But I have two amendments to the uh, Concealed uh, Weapons uh, uh, Reciprocity Act. Uh, both of them are very simple, and one is, of course, uh, this section does not apply in the case of any person convicted of an offense of domestic violence or stalking under the law of a state or Indian tribe. And I can't imagine that we'd not want to have such an amendment uh, that addresses the question of domestic violence. The, the perpetrator in Sutherland was a domestic violence abuser, uh, and here he was with a gun, and the problem was that that information was not sent to Nix. That is that First Amendment of that bill. And the Second Amendment is for any person convicted of a hate crime as defined under Section 249 for any substantially similar offense under the law of any state from carrying under this bill. We know that the perpetrator in Charlottesville um, was able to get guns because they sold the guns before his uh, actual review was completed. Uh, if that wasn't a person who was spewing hate, all of his websites showed it. And of course, he was able to sit amongst uh, prayer warriors, if you will, people on a Wednesday night prayer service or in their church uh, seeking the comfort of God, and he had, uh, with his hateful um, uh, perspective, had a weapon to kill all nine of them. Uh, lastly, I would say this. Um, as I began to say, the chiefs have concern about their men and women who patrol. And I think the one element of this reciprocity bill is the stops. And we've seen tragic circumstances that have countered what most families of men and women in law enforcement want, for them to come home safely. And I agree with them. And I like to add enhanced community police relations as well. They are concerned as to how these officers determine uh, the legitimacy and credibility of the permit that's been given to them out the window that they may have gotten from any manner of places that are not the state in which that officer is in. You will now burden that officer in stops 
to try and, uh, if I might visually, hold up and get a microscope here uh, our, and be able to determine what is this? Is this one that tracks or follows the law of my particular state? Uh, I think this bill, um, particularly dealing with the Concealed to Carry Reciprocity Act, uh, is uh, dangerous. Uh, and um, there are many other ways to provide uh, protection for individuals traveling, but more importantly, uh, law enforcement uh, has that privilege, uh, and I really think that um, this is an excessive bill. With that, I ask uh, the Rules Committee to consider my amendments and to make them in order, and to waive any germaneness to make my amendments in order. With that, um, I would yield back. Ms. Jackson Lee, thank you very much. Ms. Slaughter? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I recently read that Wisconsin Department of Justice uh, is now required to issue a license without regard to whether the person has been convicted of violent crimes, as long as they weren't felonies. I've also read that they have removed all age requirements for gun possession in Wisconsin, and that over 1,000 10-year-olds now have gun permits in the state of Wisconsin. I actually would prefer them not coming to New York. Frankly, the outcome of 10 years old uh, children running around with guns, uh, the prospect of that gives me shivering fits. I hope that the rest of you are also concerned about that. But I, I'd also like to understand when Mr. Goodlatte's bus not busy. Mr. Goodlatte, I, I, I want to talk about what uh, Ms. Jackson Lee just brought up. Why, why was, what was the impetus for exposing law enforcement? to personal liability and litigation if they well, uh, it, uh, question somebody's under the ability to have a gun. It, it is not uncommon for false arrest uh, to have uh, that kind of liability in other matters in which uh, you uh, uh, falsely imprison or detain somebody, and so it is simply uh, included here as well. Well, the false thing here would be if you were brash enough to ask somebody if they had a gun permit. No, no, that would not constitute. What, what, is it, what exactly drives them, that? If you were to detain them for an unreasonable period of time while you uh, uh, do whatever it is you want to do to discourage people from entering your state with a concealed carry permit. Well, I sure would like to know how to do that. Uh, I know New York, we, I, I really, scares me to death, as I may perhaps uh, Mr. Nadler as well. I, uh, An I, amendment was I, added I know to the we bill. can't stop if, this bill. I know this is going to pass. There's no question about it. And we will add that to this litany of things about what you're doing with the tax bill, and then now we're going to all shoot each other uh, and all hold, no holds barred. Uh, I, I, this is not the Congress that I've, I've known and loved so many years, but it's the one we've got. So let me ask unanimous consent to put into the record uh, letters and statements of opposition to H.R. 38 uh, by the following. 17 Attorneys General, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Bar Association, the American Federation of Teachers, Amnesty International USA, the Association of Prosecuting Attorneys, Faiths United to Prevent Gun Violence, Gifford's Law Enforcement Coalition, the International Association of Chiefs of Police, Law Enforcement Partnership to Prevent Gun Violence, Major Cities Chiefs, the National Task Force to End Sexual and Domestic Violence, Third Way, and the United States Conference of Mayors. And I imagine we had time. We've gotten a great many more than Without that. objection, we'll enter that into the record. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just say that this is one of the saddest days in Congress for me. Um, I, I don't know what it takes. Honestly, I was naive enough to think when 20 school children were shot to death in Newtown, Connecticut, that that would give people pause and say, wait a minute. It was about two weeks before Christmas, wasn't it, when that happened? All those children all thinking about holidays and great things, and the man walks in because he's allowed to have guns, and he kills them. And he kills them. The, the same thing, the people went to church in Texas, that beautiful little place there, and they all get killed going to church. Are we really going to live in a country that every time members of our family leave the house to go to anything, a concert, to school, anywhere, that we may not ever see them again? Is, is that what this Congress really wants Americans to live with? Because we're getting there, and I will tell you that I think it was 67% 
of Americans surveyed thought that the gun laws were far too lax. What do you think they're going to think about this one? Well, this bill will encourage greater enforcement of the law, and I hope that uh, uh, it what? will have the opposite of uh, opposite effect. Both the, both the concealed carry well, and the Nix fix wait, will wait, have wait, that effect. When do we expect a law that says all of us have to be armed? We I can remember when I first got here, there was a place in Georgia that wanted to do that, and everybody left it out of town. But now it's a serious issue today, Mr. Nadler. I just point out that uh, a law that uh, allows. Uh, or I should say that mandates New York or Pennsylvania mm -hmm. to allow violent misdemeanors to carry guns, concealed weapons, because some other state allows it. And how about 10 year olds? Or 10 year olds. The fact is, this is not a permissive bill. This is a mandatory bill on states to say yeah. you can't enforce your laws as long as any other state has a law that is yes. more permissive or laxer than yours. I'd also like to point out, because we keep hearing about the Second Amendment, the Second Amendment, the, the Supreme Court in District of Columbia versus Heller, uh, Justice Scalia explicitly said the Second Amendment right was not unlimited and that a variety of gun regulations were entirely consistent with the Constitution. He wrote in particular that, quote, the majority of American courts to consider the question held that prohibitions on carrying concealed weapons were lawful under the Second Amendment or state analogies, close quote. So simply invoking the Second Amendment doesn't tell you mm. that a given bill or right is mandatory under it or is prohibited under it. You have to make the analysis. And uh, they specifically said that uh, um, carrying concealed weapons uh, was not, that laws prohibiting the carrying of concealed weapons were not per se prohibited by the Second Amendment. Um, so put the Second Amendment to aside. I mean, we understand that an individual right was uh, conferred by the Supreme or the Supreme Court understood the Second Amendment to confer an individual right. Fine, but that individual right is not unlimited any more than other rights conferred by other amendments are unlimited. We have free speech, thank God. We have the First Amendment, but you can't shout fire in a crowded theater or do a lot of other things. Um, so you have to look at the specifics. And... Uh, laws by states limiting concealed weapons are without doubt constitutional under the Second Amendment. And again, what you have here is a bill that doesn't even exercise the judgment of Congress, which would be an obnoxious thing to do, to say, uh, we judge that as a matter of federal law, we're going to impose this standard on the states. It simply allows any state to impose its standards on every other state, um, which is an even worse thing to do. Well, I wanted on the record that there was a well-regulated militia in the Revolutionary War. It had its own general. His name was General Daniel Morgan. And it was used basically, I think, that I, that I know of for fact is in Pennsylvania. And farmers who lived around the battle were allowed to come to the battle, bring their own musket, shoot three times, and then fade back into the woods and go home. Now, that's pretty darn well regulated. But that has been, over the years, so drastically changed. I, I remember that uh, thinking about the time in which the Second Amendment was passed. We had a recommendation from one man to say Americans can have all the muskets they want. Uh, guns, no. But I, I, we're going in such a dangerous trend and such a dangerous movement. Uh, if everybody isn't scared to death, let me tell you, you ought to be. But I, I'm really concerned about what's happening next. I never thought we'd see this day. I yield back. Gentlemen, we just back for time. The gentleman from Georgia, distinguished gentleman from Georgia, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I appreciate uh, the chairman bringing the uh, bringing the uh, the bill before us. Uh, truth is, as has happened so often, I don't know how you all have any hearings in the Judiciary Committee at all because everything you deal with is pretty white hot. Uh, right? We don't send the easy issues to the Judiciary Committee. We only send the tough uh, issues. Uh, I don't think they did it. Did you have hearings on this bill? So they didn't have hearings. They, That's, so they, I'm, I'm looking at our. Uh, I'm looking at the committee uh, uh, report uh, here. I take the gentleman's. I take the gentleman's point. I, I'm thinking about uh, the hearing we're having. I understand Ms. Slaughter's concern uh, about uh, ten-year-olds in Wisconsin. I don't. I don't know anything about that. I do know the. The age to have a concealed carry permit in Wisconsin is 21. 
Uh, and so if those Wisconsinites are not 21, they're not going to carry a concealed weapon in New York, whether this law uh, passes or not. Uh, uh, Mr. Nadler, let me ask you this. I, reciprocity issues are hard. And we have concealed carry reciprocity in, in my home state, uh, 32 uh, states uh, already have reciprocity with us. So we've but, they, worked, but they've chosen to do that. Absolutely. We've worked this out in a negotiated way. Uh, take, me, take me back. I know if I'm a 16-year-old New Yorker, uh, I'm not allowed to drive in New York City. Uh, but as a 16-year-old uh, 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 Oklahoman, uh, I can grab my uh, car and drive right through uh, Times Square uh, with it. We, we regularly uh, have uh, reciprocity uh, rules uh, that... Yeah, but the, but the states have agreed to those. The, I don't think that is imposed by the federal government. You think the driver's license reciprocity is agreed to by your attorney general, not the... Not, not by the, the attorney general, probably by the legislature uh, at some point in the past. The, I have... Uh, great respect for the Second Amendment. I have great respect for the Ninth and Tenth Amendments, uh, too. And so it, uh, uh, issues like this give me a uh, great pause. My friend from New York cited uh, 17 attorneys general that, uh, that opposed uh, this measure. Uh, the Chiefs of Police. They, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to cite uh, uh, 23 uh, state attorneys general, uh, the highest law enforcement officers of the land, who support uh, this measure, one of them from the great state of Georgia. Uh, I have real qualms about the federal government uh, telling uh, states how to conduct their business, but, particularly when states have been so successful at creating these reciprocity agreements. But let me just read uh, uh, from this uh, letter, again, signed by 23 state attorneys general. Uh, we write in support of the Concealed Carry Reciprocity Act of, of uh, 2017. We share a strong uh, interest uh, in the protection of our citizens' Second Amendment rights, and we are committed to supporting federal and state policies uh, to uh, preserve these constitutional rights. These bills, talking about S-446 and, and H.R. 38, if enacted, would eliminate significant obstacles uh, to the exercise uh, of the right to keep and bear arms. Go on to talk about how they, it will amplify state uh, laws opposed to overrule it, Mr. Nadler. What, what they would eliminate are the rights of states to regulate those questions within their own, within their own borders. Um, we all pay... Uh, uh, homage, I suppose, I can't think of a better word, to states' rights, to the ability of states to make decisions for their own. We all, on some occasions, say, no, not here. Here we'll impose a federal standard and other places. We won't. Um, but again, uh, and, and, and one can debate the wisdom of those particular decisions. We should enforce a federal standard or let the states do what they want. But here, we're, we're going worse. I mean, we're saying that one state, uh, Oklahoma, let's say, uh, Oklahoma may find it uh, prudent uh, to allow uh, people who've been convicted of uh, violent misdemeanors to have a concealed carry permit. And maybe, I mean, maybe some Oklahomans would disagree with that decision by the state government. Maybe they won't, but that's their decision. New York finds it not prudent. And I, I don't know what the conditions are in Oklahoma, but I certainly wouldn't want a violent misdemeanant while uh, carrying a concealed weapon on a subway or a bus or and other uh, uh, crowded uh, conditions that you may have less of in Oklahoma or some other states. And again, New York should make that decision. What, here, what you're doing is not only not having the federal government make that decision, you're having a state make the decision for itself, which then gets enforced in every other state. And as I said, since the Fugitive Slave Act, I'm not aware of too many instances where you use federal power to say that the law of state A must be enforced in state B, whether state B likes it or not. That's a, a, a in derogation of the sovereignty of state B, of the ability of, the, of that state to legislate it for itself. Now, Mr. Sessions, I think it was, who, who talked before about the ability and the um, um, utility of law-abiding citizens uh, carrying uh, uh, concealed weapons. A violent misdemeanant is not a law-abiding citizen. Now, you can disagree as to whether we should uh, exempt from the general right to carry only felons or also violent misdemeanants or only violent felons, but that's a decision or ought to be a decision for the state. That's our general rule that states make those decisions. States enact their criminal, co criminal laws. Um, so we're telling, by this law, we're telling every state that doesn't want someone who's committed a violent misdemeanor to carry concealed weapons. You must permit it if some other state permits it. Why should we do that? 
Well, the gentleman makes a, an important distinction. Uh, it, it would not be accurate to describe uh, this bill as, as one that, that takes the laws of Georgia and imposes them on New York. It, oh, does, it does take a license of Georgia and asks New York to recognize that license. No, it demands that New York, it, it mandates but, that New York recognize that license. They, that, that's absolutely correct. I'm allowed to carry uh, in, in, in Georgia under the laws of the state of Georgia with my concealed carry permit. This bill would ask New York to honor my permit, this but, bill would would require, New York to honor that but would require me to follow the laws of New York with respect to that permit. No, because the laws of New York do not permit, assuming you're a violent misdemeanant, the laws of New York would not permit you to have a concealed weapon, but the laws of Georgia would, and the law of Georgia would, would prevail in New York the, under this you, bill. You, you raise an interesting question that I, I have not asked, and I'll, I'll ask it since I have a, a, a panel uh, here. The licensure uh, that says I will not issue a license to someone unless they are of a certain age, I will not issue a license to someone unless they uh, uh, do not uh, have X, Y, and Z uh, in their, uh, in their uh, past. Mm -hmm. There is no new, uh, I'll ask, there's a question, is there a New York law that affirmatively prohibits people from having a gun under those circumstances? Yes. Or is New York law that we will not issue a license to someone who has, uh, uh, who, who has those, those issues? Well, New York law makes it illegal for anyone without a license to, to carry a gun, obviously. So, so the answer is, so there's no distinction, really. Um, New York, the New York legislature, New York people through the legislature have determined that People with vi who've committed violent misdemeanors, for example, should not be permitted to carry concealed weapons in New York. And what this bill would do would be to say, never mind that determination. If someone comes from a state that's made a contrary determination, it prevails in New York. May I that's add? Right. The, the, the licenses, the, the licenses are, are recognized. Not, Jackson, just, not just that the license is recognized, that if, 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 if a New York City cop or a, or, or, or a Canandaigua cop upstate um, stops someone in a, you know, for speeding or whatever and finds out that he's carrying a concealed weapon and finds out that he is a misdemeanor, a, a violent, mis that he's committed a violent misdemeanor in the past. Under New York law, he would be arrested for illegally carrying a, a gun. Uh, under this law, he would not because the New York law, in effect, is overridden mm -hmm. if he comes from a state that permits it. And the real question is, why should you permit the law of one state to override the law of a different state, which may prevail under different circumstances, which may have different? And we generally allow, unless the federal government is going to come in and say, our general requirement for uniformity, for some reason, we demand the following standard, which we do sometimes. But unless that is the case, we let the states determine what goes on within their own borders. And here, you're saying, because Oklahoma has decided one standard, we will enforce Oklahoma's standard in New York. Licensure standard. Uh, Not just help licensure me. standard. Help me, Who's Mr. Goodlatte. Who's carrying? Who's allowed to carry? It, it, in New York, in, by, under New York law, if I'm 16 years old, I am not allowed to drive in New York City, period. In New period. York City. In New York, York City. State I, you are. I, I am, I am, I'm prohibited yes. from driving in the, in the city, yet uh, with my Georgia driver's license, at 16, I can go rolling right on down because the, the, legislature, the, 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 the because, streets. Because the legislature of New York found it expedient to make that accommodation, that's right. and that's to, their privilege. To, to recognize the, the licensure, the, the traffic laws of New York continue to apply, if, if, if but the my general license would, if the general is accepted. Yield. I'd be happy to yield. The difference here is that there is no federal constitutional right to drive a car. There is a federal constitutional right to keep and bear arms. Uh, and so, therefore, the ability to t transport that firearm... Uh, if the concealed carry permit has been granted uh, to the individual uh, by a state that has been through a process uh, to make that determination. The same now, uh, the gentleman from New York brought up the, the Wisconsin uh, determination, which is correct, that they have determined uh, that uh, there will be no minimum age to possess a firearm. Actually, Wisconsin's not the first one to the gate on this. They are the 34th state to permit <coughs> individuals to possess firearms based upon uh, no minimum age requirement. However, Wisconsin has a age 21 concealed carry permit. Uh, so uh, if someone shows up in New York uh, and they uh, have concealed a firearm and they're 16 years of age, uh, they're in violation of both the New York and the Wisconsin 
uh, concealed carry permit law, and they're not they're not in compliance with the law. Now, with regard to your point uh, that uh, there are certain items under New York law, yes, this bill makes it very clear that while the licensing process is the determination of the state of of residence of the of the citizen, it is the 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 uh, state that they take the firearm into uh, whose laws they must comply with regard to uh, how that's exercised. Not who, not, you know, if, if, if uh, uh, first of all, when you talk about violent misdemeanors, there, the federal law prohibits uh, people guilty of domestic violence, which is a misdemeanor in, in most instances, and they can't have a firearm at all, so they can't use it as a concealed carry. But there are other... Um, that the gentleman from New York would describe as a violent uh, misdemeanor that is not covered by that, uh, stalking uh, and other things. And that uh, is an exception here to make clear uh, that if uh, people meet the basis for uh, carrying the weapon in their own state, they'll be able to transport it across state lines. And Congress has very clear authority uh, to, to uh, allow this. Now, this isn't the first time we've seen similar language, Mr. Chairman. In the past, I recall states that did not have a licensure requirement that simply allowed concealed carry by their citizens as a constitutional right being left out uh, of this uh, rubric, that I have a license from Georgia because Georgia issues a license. But if I come from a state that doesn't issue a license, uh, historically we voted on bills that offer no protections uh, to me. How has this uh, bill addressed that? Well, we have addressed it by saying that as long as you have met the requirements of your home state concealed carry permit, you no longer have to fear entering certain states where people have been uh, arrested and charged with serious crimes, oftentimes uh, not even realizing that they are doing so uh, simply for exercising their constitutional right to keep and bear arms. And simply showing my driver's license then, if I come from one of those non-permit states, that satisfies my burden of of demonstrating can, that I'm If you can establish that your state has a constitutional concealed carry, you can do that. All right. May I um, just offer a point about the constitutional Jackson, concealed to carry, or concealed carry. Um, the gentleman from New York made a point, a very, very valid point, that the Supreme Court has indicated that uh, the Second Amendment is not unfettered and um, that there is a, a proper regulatory scheme that can be accepted. Uh, the chairman indicates that uh, the individuals carrying the guns don't have a fear. Going into the jurisdiction, those people have a fear, and the law enforcement officers will have a fear. You're asking law enforcement to do two things on the street. You're asking, first of all, to look and see whether the Georgia license is, in fact, credible, that it is a legitimate uh, Georgia uh, right to conceal carry. Uh, having not been a Georgia police officer and being a New York police officer or a Texas police officer, and our laws are, are very much like Georgia, they would have to make a determination on the street. Secondarily, they have to make a determination as to whether this person still uh, complies with New York laws. Uh, I think they would probably want to do so, which is if there is uh, a uh, misdemeanor violent charge that they have had, uh, it may be acceptable in Georgia, but it may not be acceptable in New York. So let me just read uh, from the chief of police of uh, the fourth largest city in the nation, soon to be the third largest city in the nation, Houston. As it relates to concealed weapons, Chief Acevedo says, each state has carefully crafted its own laws relating to concealed weapons. While Congress has heretofore respected the constitutional sovereignty of the states, there is legislation now pending that would undermine the authority of state laws relating to carrying of weapons. We strongly urge Congress to reject the misguided and impractical proposal for reciprocity, <coughs> as police officers could not be expected to recognize legitimate or forged permits from thousands of jurisdictions. It would be impossible to determine which persons are authorized to carry a concealed weapon. Uh, this is what you're going to face across the nation. In spite of the 27 attorney generals and 34 states, you've got to talk to chiefs of police and patrol officers. I frankly, and I'm talking about individual patrol officers, and I frankly believe, ask unanimous consent to submit this uh, letter into the record, um, uh, Mr. Chairman. And ask Without objection, has been granted to win the gentlewoman. And I ask unanimous consent for major cities' chief association to be into the record and the national task force to end sexual and domestic violence, opposing this vigorously. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, you're back. Thank you very much, Mr. McGovern.
Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, well, I, I can't believe we're here having this discussion, and I can't believe this legislation is even before us. I mean, as the general lady from New York pointed out at the outset here, I mean, we have, we have some pressing, urgent things that need to be done, like keep the government open, for example, uh, that now has been pushed off, and we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, we need to reauthorize the CHIP program to make sure our kids get access to health care. I mean, is a, we have hurricane relief issues that we need to deal with. We have, I mean, a, a gazillion things that are urgent that need to be dealt with now, and here we are dealing with this. Um, and, you know, and it is a little bit frustrating to sit here <coughs> um, and, and be told that there were no hearings on this legislation. I mean, it's December, all right? So it's not like we just started a new session. It's December. Um, and it would have been nice um, to bring the police chiefs that Ms. Jackson Lee referred to up to the Judiciary Committee, let them express their concerns or, or others, or you could bring anybody you want who supports this uh, legislation. But, uh, I mean, uh, there is value in listening to people outside of the little bubble here in, uh, in Washington. And I, I look at this and I, I ask myself, you know, how much in the bag with the National Rifle Association is this leadership in this House? I mean, th this makes no sense that you are going to impose the weakest standards that exist in some states on states that have higher standards when it comes to issuing licenses for those who can carry concealed weapons. You know, I, I, I looked at the National Rifle Association's webpage. Concealed carry reciprocity is the NRA's highest legislative priority uh, in this Congress. Um, and so we all know why we're here today. I mean, we follow the money. I mean, this is, uh, this is about campaigning. This is about contributions to political parties and, and members of Congress who are worried about the, about the next election. But this is not about what's in the best interest of the American people. I mean, this bill we're taking up today would force states to let violent offenders and people with no firearm safety training carry hidden, loaded guns, even if those people could not, could not otherwise legally purchase a gun uh, in the state. I mean, really? I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't get that. Um, as Mr. Nadler pointed out, under current law, each state determines if it will recognize concealed carry permits issued by other states. Currently, 11 states do not recognize concealed carry permits issued by other states. Most states only recognize concealed carry permits issued by states with equivalent standards. This is a rush to the bottom. This is, I, I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm trying to understand why anybody would think this is a good idea. Uh, the gentleman from Georgia tried to compare these to driver's licenses. Well, dri you know, for, as I understand it, driver's license, is, 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 as far as they're concerned, there are standard verifiable um, documents with the same criteria nationwide. <laughs> Concealed carry, there's no uniform standard security features, no national and sometimes no statewide da database. I mean, driver's license require things like vision uh, and laws and, and in-person driving tests. Concealed carry uh, licenses, as we have learned, the training varies widely and it, it isn't even always required by states. And yet you're going to impose those low standards on my state? I mean, Massachusetts has the lowest firearm death rate in the entire country. I'm proud of that. Don't screw around with what we have done in my state by trying to forcibly, through statute, lower the standards. I mean, this is just not right. You know, I, I can go on and on and on and on, but you know what? This is a big waste of time. And I'm hoping the Senate won't even take it up uh, because this is, uh, this is just a, a terrible idea. This is about campaign contributions. This is not about good policy. And uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. Gentlemen, yields back time. Thank you very much. The gentleman from uh, Georgia. The gentleman, can I just yes, sir. One excuse excuse me, just a moment, please. You, yes, sir. I mean, I, at the beginning, you mentioned to Ms. Slaughter that uh, you, were, you guaranteed a fair fight on this, yeah. on this issue. Well, that, to me, means uh, not just our ability to talk up here. It means making sure that the amendments, like the one that have been offered here today and others, uh, be made in order. And I, I hope that this means either an open rule or that all amendments that have been introduced be be, uh, be made over. That's a fair fight. Well, th th thank you very much. Th thank you very much. Uh, I, well, yes, ma'am. What I tried to have the basis of my discussion with the gentlewoman was the time in which we would do this. The time of day that we would do this, knowing what we had with some accommodations that you understand and I do of families being in town today. 
And I, the, the, the premise was, I, to, I, I asked her about the time. She said, we'd like time to talk about the gun bill. And I said, you'll be allowed that time. And we're doing every bit of that. Well, I appreciate it. We don't have anything else to talk about because the C heart is clear. Well, so whether or not. Obviously, we want to talk about the gun bill. Well, but I, I, we, we admitted that yesterday. Right on the phone. Admitted it right on the phone. Right on the phone. And I, I, we're Maybe, still doing that. Right. Maybe you could take a minute now while you're here and tell us when we will get it. Uh, tomorrow. What? Okay. We have, want to have a rules committee on that tomorrow. Uh, we have not got that point. Judge Hastings is going to ask me in a few minutes when we're going to do that, and then I'm going to tell him tomorrow. You're not going to tell me. Well, I, I, I told you. I, I, I told you on the phone. I told you on the phone the other day when we yeah. do it. No, I, I, on the phone the other day. We're going to do that today. Okay, but I, it but won't be a few you, minutes. Yeah. Yes, sir. Judge, judge, you wish to be recognized. Yeah. Judge, the gentleman's that, recognized. Gentleman. I just want to let you know it won't be that I will be asking that question in a few minutes, but I will ask that question. Yes, sir. Does gentleman seek recognition? Yes, I do. Gentleman's recognized. I started to go that way, and then I came back this way, and I'm just going to stay where I am. Well, I appreciate that, Thank you, Mr. Sir. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, first let me say something about uh, the National Rifle Association. Uh, every member of the National Rifle Association uh, uh, are not people who um, uh, should be uh, put in the same category as others. Many of them would look at the same provision that we are dealing with today and have difficulty understanding uh, why we are doing this. Um, there is a distinction in almost all organizations between the membership and the leadership. And the leadership of the National Rifle Association um, is um, uh, really, really a set of very cunning individuals who are determined um, uh, to support um, gun manufacturers who somehow or another get left out of the equation when we talk about these matters. We put it on the National Rifle Association who really are doing nothing but the bidding of gun manufacturers. I remember in Sandy Hook, uh, many guns were uh, manufactured in the gun association, the manufacturing association was less than six miles from Sandy Hook Elementary School. During all of the brohoha, they quietly moved out of uh, that area. And I find it uh, passing strange uh, that we uh, focus sometimes on matters um, uh, differently uh, than, in my view, uh, uh, we should. Um, Mr. McGovern mentioned, as did Ms. Slaughter, the significant number of issues that we have are uh, dealing with. Uh, all of us awakened today to um, a report um, uh, that one of the highest variable rates for HOV driving in Virginia on I-66 is $34 uh, uh, to drive uh, at a certain time on that highway. And that's because we haven't paid attention to all of the extraordinary needs with crumbling roads and crumbling bridges uh, in our country. And here we are talking about something without addressing the real significant uh, issues with reference uh, to gun violence. Um, I'm a gun owner. I want to make that clear because I always uh, get threats, and I understand that. I don't worry about the people that call and say they're going to harm me. I worry about the ones that don't call. Uh, but the simple fact of the matter is, uh, and Mr. Goodlatte, I want to address this to you. This is my Florida gun permit to carry a concealed weapon. In the streets, these can be knocked off and proliferate all over the place uh, uh, to carry concealed uh, uh, matters. If I have this permit and I've carried a gun to a state that doesn't allow for uh, carry, compared to this is my Florida driver's license, and I won't even get into the falsification part, 
My argument to you is that if a police officer stops me and looks at my driver's license, he or she can determine that I have a valid <coughs> driver's license. But if a police officer stops me, how is that police officer with no hotline established, as would be the case with driver's license, make a determination whether or not I'm valid or with reference to carrying a concealed weapon? Well, Mr. Hastings, as you uh, and Mr. Nadler have noted, uh, with regard to driver's licenses, states have cooperated with each other. But it was noted here that 10 states are completely unwilling to recognize the constitutional right, constitutional right of people to travel with their firearm outside of their home state into the, the other state. So mm -hmm. even if that state and every state but one has a concealed carry permit process, that one state being Vermont, and they, they have constitutional concealed carry. So you do agree, so, so, excuse me, no. reclaiming my time. So you do agree that there's no state-by-state -state hotline, for example, to confirm that a permit is valid? Be, be great if more efforts were, were taken to improve that, but uh, that is not a necessary thing. It wasn't necessary when, when driver's licenses were first recognized across state lines. You mean to tell me if a police officer stops somebody and they claim they have a, 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 a carry permit, that a police officer shouldn't be able to determine whether or not that is valid? Okay. They can determine, but they cannot unreasonably detain the individual. Gee whiz. This gets crazier and crazier. Um, uh, here we have, in my judgment, collectively lost our minds with all of the things that we've seen with uh, our gun violence. Um, and Mr. Chairman, I want to include in the record so as how we can put this issue all to rest. I could spend the rest of my time dealing with concealed carry permits or nothing like driver's license, but let me uh, ask unanimous consent to include every town's analysis that I commend to Mr. Goodlatte. Without objection, uh, Peter. Uh, that, that he read. As regards car concealed carry, usually Congress sets the floor for conduct. In other words, if states want to take further action on a given matter to strengthen the law, they may do so, but they may not provide fewer protections than the floor established by Congress. The approach we see here today with concealed carry turns this approach on its head and rewards the bottom dwellers. In other words, states seeking to protect victims of domestic abuse will have to yield to states who do not. Mr. Ranking member, I want to make sure I have this right. By way of example, we have two states. One allows those convicted of domestic violence to carry concealed weapons, and the other does not. Under this bill, the state that quite reasonably does not allow those convicted of domestic violence to carry concealed weapons will have to welcome in a person and their concealed weapon because that person's state allows domestic abusers to carry concealed weapons. Is that correct? I was talking to you, Jerry. Yes. All right. Um, let me share with you all in here the statement of uh, country music. <coughs> Musicians. That's all right, Mr. You said ranking member. I thought you meant Mr. Sessions. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah, well. <laughs> no, I was, I, I was talking to you, but that's okay. Country musician Caleb Keita um, was mindful of uh, the hailstorm of bullets in Las Vegas. And he played uh, guitar with the Josh Abbott band, which had performed that Sunday afternoon just hours before 59 people were killed there. Let me quote him. He says, I've been a proponent of the Second Amendment my entire life until the events of last night. I cannot express how wrong I was. We actually have members of our crew with CHL licenses and legal firearms on the bus. They were useless. 
We couldn't touch them for fear police might think that we were part of the massacre and shoot us. A small group, or one man, laid waste to a city with dedicated, fearless police officers desperately trying uh, to help because of access to an insane amount of firepower. Enough is enough, he says. Um, now I want to ask you, Mr. Goodlatte, how do you handle 50 people getting on an airplane with a carry permit to come to any one of the uh, states. How, 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 how does that work? Uh, what, do, what do the people with their guns and their carry permits do? They have to stow them in the plane. They can't carry them on board the plane whether they have a concealed carry permit or not. What if all of them arrive about 15 minutes before the shutoff time for entry. They've got to go through security like all the rest of us do. And so then the delay uh, of air travel will take place. No, I don't necessarily think so. I think they'll, they'll be delayed themselves from getting to the plane unless they have, as most people understand, if you want to carry uh, a firearm, you have to stow it in uh, your luggage. You can't carry it on board the plane. How about trains and buses? So trains and buses have, have different standards. But I think that uh, the... Uh, uh, transportation provider has the right to determine that. How about 175 people showing up here at the Capitol going same, through the magnetometer? Same thing. They're not going to be allowed into the country. But into they the should be under this no. law? No. No. Why, why shouldn't they? They are allowed to carry, mm -hmm. and we have because, reciprocity because under your the, bill. This bill makes it very clear that uh, not only the federal government, state and local governments can make that determination. So and by the way, and by the way, can any private uh, business owner? So if you have a bar or uh, whatever, you can you can prohibit uh, you you can make that determination as a private citizen that you're not going to allow people to carry a firearm into your bar. How would I know that the person had a gun? You can ask them. You can have a metal detector. So everybody that. Or enters into bars and restaurants nowadays are going to be subjected to magnetometers? If, they, if, the, if the proprietor chooses to do that, yes. Mr. Goodlatte, have you ever been on Broadway? I've been to shows, yes. Yeah. And you know the crush of people that are there? Would you personally like for every one of those people to be carrying a gun? <laughs> Uh, if they have a lawful concealed carry permit, I would feel safer uh, than if I were at a venue where no one was allowed to have a gun except the person who smuggled a gun in for the purpose of committing mayhem. Would we as congresspersons be permitted to carry our guns on the floor of the House of Representatives? Uh, no, I don't believe so. But I, Why? I'm not, Why wouldn't we? I, I, that would depend on the rules of the House. I'm here to talk about this bill today, not about to propose changes to other then rules. Then tell me why you chose to put this bill with the Nix fix, when in fact the Nix fix would have mine and your support, and this bill is going nowhere fast other than utilizing the time that I'm utilizing now. Well, um, I, believe, I believe that both bills uh, complement each other in keeping people safe, because the statistics are very clear that, uh, for example, in your state of Florida, uh, which has the largest number of concealed carry permit holders uh, of any and state in the country. And I want to make it clear country. to my detractors that I'm one of them, but go yeah, ahead. Yeah, no, no, I, and, I, and I, I applaud you for that. But uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, studies have been done in Florida and that uh, concealed carry permit holders have a, an incredibly uh, lower uh, incidents of uh, committing uh, violence than the average citizen, uh, even off-duty police officers. So I really don't have the time to help dispel that myth, and I don't want to bore my colleagues, but I do want to use um, uh, the Giffords um, uh, uh, organization uh, to compare Florida to Georgia, for example. Florida, an applicant for a Florida concealed firearms license, must demonstrate competence with a firearm um, through completion of a course of participation in organized shooting or military service. Not so in Georgia. 
In Florida, an applicant is ineligible for a license if within the last three years he or she was convicted of using a firearm. Not so in Georgia. A license will be denied if the applicant has been found guilty of any misdemeanor crime or violence in Florida. Not so in Georgia. The Florida Crime Information Center state maintains an automated listing of license holders and related pertinent information. Georgia law specifically prohibits the creation of a statewide database of license holders, which comes back to my original point of not being able to know who the carriers are. But in the markup, several of our colleagues offered matters that were defeated. And I find it abhorrent. The violent misdemeanor offense was offered by Mr. Nadler uh, to pro uh, prohibit offenders who've been convicted of a violent misdemeanor in the past three years from carrying a concealed gun in a state where that conviction would otherwise disqualify them from carrying in public. It was defeated. Ms. Jackson Lee offered an amendment to block domestic abusers and stalkers from taking advantage of imposed reciprocity. It was defeated. Ms. Lofgren uh, offered an amendment to require that an individual be a resident of the state from which their concealed care permit is issued in order for the individual to take advantage of the bill's reciprocity. It was defeated. Um, uh, Mr. Raskin of Maryland offered uh, protecting state public safety standards, very sensible measure. Um, the amendment failed despite Democratic support, uh, and it really failed by voice vote. My colleague Ted Deutsch offered an amendment to ensure uh, safeguarding of private property, asking that um, our private uh, our property uh, our rights be uh, protected. It was defeated. State laws with age restrictions. Mr. Cohen offered that one in committee. It was defeated. High capacity ammunition magazines offered by Mr. Cicilline uh, to prohibit a bill from allowing the carrying of high capacity magazines for use with handguns. Defeated. State laws concerning handgun possession assaulting or impersonating a police officer, restrictions on concealed carry on certain beaches offered by my colleague, Mr. Deutsch, um, one that would allow that land administer, administered and managed by the Army Corps of Engineers uh, not allow uh, for guns to be on it, it failed. Animal cruelty offered by Mr. Deutsch failed, requiring periodic background checks and verification mechanisms, that failed. Respecting the laws of the District of Columbia, we knew that was going to fail. Hate crimes offenses. With the increase of hate crimes, Ms. Jackson Lee offered a measure, and we've had an increase everywhere in this nation of every kind of hate crime, and yet we could not have something um, 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 uh, offered and made in law, uh, part of this bill. Driving under the influence, background check requirements. All of these measures were defeated in committee. And I can tell you this, um, what we have in this country is a gun violence epidemic. And the evidence bears this out, and one would think that it does not need repeating. But then bills like this one become before, uh, come before us and becomes quite clear that some folks up here either just don't care or are simply too beholden to the gun manufacturers and the gun lobby. This bill, without a shadow of a doubt, will make it easier for domestic abusers and stalkers to commit murder. More than half of women killed by guns in this country were killed by intimate partners or family members. And let us not forget that federal law only blocks domestic abusers or spouses. Dating partners and convicted stalkers are not covered. Many states have addressed this glaring loophole in federal law and moved to block abusive dating partners and stalkers carrying concealed handguns, this bill would needlessly eviscerate all these sensible laws. We sit in the wake of mass shootings after mass shooting. We sit in the wake of thousands upon thousands of dead people killed by guns wielded by domestic abusers. And this is the bill we get, a bill pushed by the powerful gun lobby and gun manufacturers at the expense of sound policies. 
And don't think just because you attach this ridiculous bill to something sensible like strengthening NICS means you have done something particularly clever. Just because you add a dash of sugar to a dirt pie doesn't mean you've got yourself something worth eating. I can't even begin to talk about the disappointment that I'm sure many Americans feel that we are here talking about gun laws with all of the problems that this nation is confronted with and not dealing with uh, gun epidemics and going to do in this measure a, a, a bump stock study. You don't need no damn study. What you need is to stop that madness from allowing people um, uh, to alter uh, weapons to that extent. And don't give me that garbage about the Second Amendment. The people that did the uh, Second Amendment had no idea we were going to be confronted with what we are confronted with in our society today. Things have evolved in each one of these states. You all run in here time and time again arguing states' rights until it becomes sensible for you um, uh, to do so. And now states' rights don't matter. You're going to override it um, uh, uh, in each one of the states. I offer, Mr. Chairman, by unanimous consent, every town's analysis of uh, overriding um, uh, concealed carry laws. <coughs> And I'd like to enter the Giffords um, uh, report that I spoke of as well. I also am going to enter every town's concealed carry reci reciprocity focus on uh, states to let domestic abusers carry handguns. We'll we'll in and the Giffords federally mandate concealed carry reciprocity measure. Without objection. In addition, they have mandated uh, concealed uh, uh, carry on gun of violence, state smart gun laws would be dangerously undermined. Without objection. Be in the record. In addition, every town's analysis of overriding state public safety laws, which is really very clear. Without objection. We'll enter that and I gather I don't need to put in the record, Mr. Chairman, all of the matters are dealing with um, uh, the report itself. Um, obviously, we're disappointed that there were no hearings, um, and there should have been for something um, uh, to uh, allow for different views um, uh, uh, to be heard. I also want to put the Kansas Star uh, article on the fine young man, Caleb Keeter, that I recited from uh, his tweet into the record. Mr. Without objection. Uh, in addition, um, the... Someone fact-checked the uh, chairman of the House. I'll leave that, leave that out. Bob Goodlatte is my friend. I like him. But I think that this is uh, insanity personified for us to be up here dealing with something of this significance and not dealing with the real issues. No one in this room can make me understand why anybody other than law enforcement and military people need to have an assault weapon. When I came here, we passed an assault weapon measure. Mr. Nadler was here. We worked on that measure, and it was done. And now we can't even get altered weapons uh, to be addressed. How many more people have to be killed? How many more people have to commit suicide with weapons? How many abusers of women or men have, do we have to hear before we take action um, and do uh, what is necessary to address the gun epidemic. There was uh, a Surgeon General here, Mr. Satcher. He literally got run out of town because he uh, made uh, us aware that there was a gun violence epidemic in this country uh, associated with a number of other uh, epidemics that we are failing to deal with. Uh, here we have an opioid crisis of uh, magnanimous support uh, uh, proportions, and what we are up here talking about is allowing people to carry guns all over this country um, uh, into places. I hope that none of your relatives, as some of mine, have been killed by weapons. I hope that you think that because you are in a bar 
or you were in a, a concert or a theater that if 50 people have a gun and the law enforcement people are trying to find the one person doing the killing, I hope you think that that will not uh, cause problems, but I can tell you your thinking is faulty and you are getting ready to help lead to further disasters, and I, for one, resent it. Your meal's back is time. Is there any other member that would seek time? Mr. Seeing Chairman. none. Yes, ma'am. Chairman, if I might, I just want to reinforce uh, some comments that Mr. Hastings made, which is to again raise my amendments dealing with hate crimes and domestic violence. Uh, the rebuttal to the submission of these amendments is that they're federal law. Uh, my point is that this is a uh, freestanding bill that should be comprehensive on two of the most heinous aspects um, of uh, a, a background of a uh, intending uh, concealed to carry individual uh, and would jeopardize the lives of individuals uh, crossing state lines as evidenced by Charlottesville and as evidenced by the um, military uh, person who engaged in mass murder in one of our churches in Texas. So I'd ask my amendments on that is issue to be um, made in order and also with respect to a more detailed a requirement of the military to submit data to. But what point I want to make about uh, Mr. Hastings is the fact in the litany of questions, he evidenced the confusion that will come about with the concealed weapon, whether it is Broadway, whether it is uh, the uh, cathedral on uh, Fifth Avenue, uh, whether it is in the Boston Commons, uh, whether or not it's at the University of Virginia, uh, it is massive confusion for law enforcement to be determined what you have is legitimate. And I just want to make the point, it seems that every horror story of killing, we have a sense of emotion. Uh, we were on the pathway of banning uh, bump stocks. Um, I don't know why we stopped, why we couldn't have a simple bill uh, that would ban uh, these bump stocks. And so what we wound up with is provision 206 that just requires an attorney general report on the use of bump stocks. We know what the use of bump stocks is. They use them in Las Vegas and 58 people are dead. So I don't know whether this puts an end to real legislation on bump stocks, but here we are. And so um, I hope my amendments would be able to be made in order, but I do agree uh, that uh, this is a very disappointing. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield. Yes, ma'am, and I want to thank you so much. Uh, I, 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 I hasten to, to say this at all because I'm really not trying to engage anybody, but Mr. Chairman, I think that what you did is you brought up a bill today that today is allowed by law by states that have already agreed to do this. I have not heard any bit of evidence that suggests that that's not working today in the states that do this. I think that what happened is is that it, that this would allow anybody that has a permit to be respected by another state, uh, but you would still have to follow the laws of the state that you go to. If if it said you can't walk walk into a building with one, you can't say well, it was okay to walk into the state capital of Texas as it is with a gun, but you can do it here. That's not what this is about. What it is about is to respect that person that travels, that goes to another state, to respect that they have the license to follow the laws in the state that they're in. And for anybody to think that I could get on a plane in Dallas, Texas, and fly to Austin, Texas with my gun, it just is not the way it is. It is not that way. I'd have to follow the laws whether I was going from Washington, Dallas to Washington, or Washington to Dallas, same as I was going to Austin. So I, I don't know if this is as confusing as the pitch is today. I want to thank all three of you for being here today. Please remind you that anything you brought in writing would be left for awesome stuff. I appreciate you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to go to the second panel, please. Mr. Nadler, thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, Ms. Jackson Lee. We're going to go to the next panel, panel two. Uh, Mr. Snyder, Mr. Snyder and Ms. Titus. Brad, it was good to see you at dinner the other night. I enjoyed that very much, and thank you for your uh, not only uh, insistence that we uh, enjoyed the uh, the dinner, I enjoyed your presence and your company. Ms. Titus, we're delighted that you're here, the gentlewoman. I uh, would know that both of you would be extended the privileges of whatever you brought to us in writing today. We'd like to have you leave for Austin Stockford to complete the record. The gentlewoman is uh, acknowledging she may proceed. 
Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. As all of you know, just a little over two months ago, the deadliest shooting in modern U.S. history occurred in the heart of my district. 58 innocent people were killed, over 500 were injured, and the lives of thousands of friends and family members have been changed forever. Now, in the two months since that time, absolutely nothing has happened until today. So I was optimistic that maybe something would get done, but instead, I'm here listening to testimony, not about banning or regulating bump stocks, not about expanding or cleaning up background checks, but instead about expanding access to concealed weapons. I, I am like Mr. McGovern, I, I just really can't believe it, and I don't know what to go back to my district and tell these people that Congress is doing, and how little they care about the plight not only of those 58 and their family and friends, but also of the hundreds who have been killed in this country since that occurred. Now, I sat here for hours or so and listened to testimony that, again, is astounding. We have parsed words about the difference between regulation and outlawing. We have heard ridiculous assumptions about how carrying a concealed weapon can make us safer. Well, I can tell you those people at the concert would not have been safer if they were carrying weapons because the shooter was a 1,000 feet away uh, in a tall story building. There's no way that they would have made you safer. And so my question is, if this bill is so great and you are so proud of it and you want to pass it so much, why didn't you just bring it as an independent bill? Why did you have to attack it as a poison pill onto a bipartisan measure that had broad support from members of the Congress, including myself as a co-sponsor, and all the organizations to try to get at a real problem and do the next fix? Why did you tack it on? And frankly, that's kind of why I'm here. I didn't think I was going to be adding an amendment, but I just couldn't help myself. You know, we have, um, we have seen through the course of this year in this Congress this kind of behavior occurring over and over again. You have seen mysterious amendments appear and other amendments that have been considered in committee disappear. Bills change from the time they are heard and passed by committee till, they till the time they get to rules. It is no wonder that the people of this country do not trust what is going on back here in Congress. It was just this Friday that we learned that the Fix Nix bill, which is a Fix the National Instant Criminal Background Check System, introduced by my friend from Texas, Mr. Culberson, was now suddenly going to be added to the expanded back, uh, concealed carry bill. For no apparent good reason, it's just a matter of deception that goes on behind closed doors. So my amendment is very simple. It would just strike the entirety of Title I of the bill, which is the concealed carry provision. You want that? Go for it, but go for it on its own. Don't add it to our bill, which is a good bill. And it would also get rid of that so-called study of bump stocks. Uh, you know, I, you've heard a lot from other people before me about the problems with the concealed carry weapon provision. I won't go into that except to say that my home state of Nevada is still the Wild West. We have pretty liberal gun laws, and yet even we don't believe that teenagers or somebody who's been convicted of a violent crime, even if it's a misdemeanor, should have the license to carry a concealed weapon. Excuse, so in, excuse, excuse me. There's no evidence that's been, no testimony that indicated that that was a fact. So what was a fact? Children are not allowed in any state to have a concealed carry weapon uh, license. Thank you. Well, as I understand it, in Nevada, the restrictions are at 19, and if you move across the state line to Idaho, you would be able to carry a weapon. I think that's a fact. We're, we're talking about conceal and carry license. Yes, I am too. Some states are 18. Thank you, Mr. Snyder. So I know an adult, an adult, an adult. Well, 18. Well, I, I don't know. I've seen some people who are in their 30s who don't act like adults. But uh, 18, 19 is not usually considered an adult. You can't gamble at 18 in Nevada. Have to be 21. But you can join the military. I appreciate that. 
And you can vote, yeah. But I, still, I stand by the point that at, at 19, you cannot carry a weapon in Nevada, but you can move to Idaho, and you can get a concealed weapon there, carry a concealed weapon. But they're considered an adult, not a child. Okay. At 19 or 18. But anyway, Nevada would have no choice but to recognize Idaho's law, even though it is more lax than Nevada. So that, you've heard all those arguments. My primary reason here is to split those bills. These are two separate issues. They, uh, the, the addition of the concealed weapon measure undermines the, the attempt to fix the reporting system, a system that needs to be fixed. And following the recipe of the judge here, adding a study about bump stocks is like building a monument. You won't do anything else, and a study like this won't tell you anything because there's so little reporting of bump stocks. You want to study? Come study those 58 crosses in my district. Then you'll see what bump stocks do. So I just um, think you ought to split these bills. If you want them, go for them, consider them, but don't add them on to something that might do a little bit of good. Mr. Tice, thank you very much. Brad, we're delighted that your gentleman's recognized. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for the time to, to be here. Uh, I want to particularly thank uh, Mr. Hastings for your remarks. I speak here very personally. Um, my Hebrew name is Shmuel Samuel. I'm named after my grandmother's brother, Sam, who was murdered when a gunman walked into his office in 1942 and shot him four times, called the police and waited for them to arrive as my uncle bled to death. My grandmother had 18 grandchildren. My cousin Jeff took his own life. He dealt with mental illness for a long time and was able to get a gun. So this is a very personal issue. So, Mr. Hastings, thank you. And I understand that many people come to this issue with their personal perspectives. I personally strongly oppose the reckless and dangerous concealed carry reciprocity legislation that this House is considering or preparing to consider. It's inconceivable to me that after more than 300 mass shooting events just this year alone, and daily gun violence in cities and communities across our country, we're voting on legislation to weaken common sense restrictions that are already in place. Concealed carry reciprocity, I believe, undermines American gun laws by forcing states to accept carry permitting standards of every other state, including some states that have no standards at all. My constituents want gun safety standards to protect our communities, not to race to the bottom and a policy that puts more of our neighbors and neighborhoods and communities at risk. Illinois has common sense regulations on concealed carry permits. For example, if you had two or more DUIs within five years, within the past five years, you do not have the right in Illinois to, to obtain a concealed weapons permit. In fact, a majority of US states deny concealed carry permits to people with multiple DUIs. This is a deliberate decision about people who often are simply too irresponsible to carry a firearm in public. Yet this bill would steamroll over states' laws, allowing multiple DUI offenders to carry anywhere in the country so long as they seek out any low standard or no standard permitting system that will issue them that permit. In a new study published earlier this year, researchers showed that among handgun owners, convictions for DUI and other alcohol-related crimes are associated with a major increase four to five fold increase in the latter risk of arrest for a firearm crime or other violent crime. In other words, these convictions for DUI are a serious red flag that a person is at risk of committing a future crime. States that have decided to bar these offend offenders have determined that they are too irresponsible to carry in public and Congress should not be overriding the decisions of these individual states. Today, I'm offering an amendment to this legislation that allows states like Illinois to continue to enforce their state laws barring people with two or more DUI offenses from carrying a concealed handgun. I urge this committee to allow a vote on my amendment so that states can continue to enforce their own common sense rules prevent preventing irresponsible concealed carry. Thank you very much. Sir, thank you very much. Ms. Slaughter. I thank you both for being here, and I know that you personally have felt the grief of uh, easily available guns. So thank you for your, for your testimony. I don't give you much hope for anything, but uh, nonetheless, I was glad to have it here and have it on the record. Thank you both. Mr. McGovern? Well, I, I, as I said earlier, I, I think uh, given the fact that there were no hearings on this bill, uh, that uh, at a minimum, 
we want a fair fight here, as the Chairman promised the, the ranking member, we ought to open this thing up so that members have an opportunity to offer their amendments. I agree with Ms. Titus, I, the idea that they, they uh, attached a, a really, really bad bill to something that had bipartisan support you know, just shows, shows how cynical this place has become. Uh, but as I said before, I mean, this is not about good policy. I mean, I follow the money. This is about money. This is about the power of the NRA. Um, and quite frankly, this is another reason why we ought to be talking about campaign finance reform, because we have to finally figure out a way to separate the, uh, the, the, the money in politics uh, uh, from, from this system, because it results in this kind of garbage being brought to the House floor. So I thank you both, and I hope your amendments are made in order. Thank you very much. And gentleman from Florida, Judge Hastings. Thank you very much, yes, Mr. Sir. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Titus and Mr. Schneider, both of you were very clear, and it's deeply appreciated. I wish your amendments uh, were uh, to be made in order. I don't think they are going to. Um, and it's kind of senseless um, uh, for us to have a good uh, policy um, uh, ruined uh, by adding, as you put it, Ms. Titus, uh, poison pills. This is a very sad day for this country, and it gets sadder with more deaths uh, and us not doing anything about it. I yield back. Gentleman yields back his time. And is there any member that would seek time? I want to thank both of you. I do recognize that both of you took a good bit of your time this afternoon to not only participate in the full hearing, but to take time to offer your thoughts and ideas. If I could please remind you to leave whatever you brought in writing for awesome stenographer to allow her to complete her job. Thank you very much. I uh, need to uh, acknowledge that the gentleman from uh, Ohio, uh, Congressman Jim Jordan, uh, came and told me that he did not have more time to uh, spend this, e this afternoon, but that he wanted to make sure that he knew that I would uh, acknowledge that he asked that we separate the two bills, the NICS from the reciprocity bill, and that that would be what his testimony would be about. I hasten to say that without regard for making that available, but it would be uh, his idea. He did not bring written comments, but had that, and I acknowledge that I would bring that forward uh, before the hearing was done. Is there any other member that would seek to be heard on H.R. 38? See none. Uh, this now closes the hearing portion. The chairman will be in receipt of a motion from the uh, gentleman from, distinguished gentleman from Oklahoma. Mr. Chairman, <coughs> I move that the committee uh, grant H.R. 38, the Concealed Carry Reciprocity Act 2017, a closed rule. Rule provides one hour of debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on the Judiciary. Rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule provides that an amendment in the nature of a substitute consisting of the text of Rules Committee Print 115-45 shall be considered as adopted and the bill as amended shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against provisions in the bill as amended. Finally, the rule provides one motion to recommit with or without instruction. Thank you very much. You've now heard the motion from the gentleman from Oklahoma. Is there a amendment or discussion to that? Yes. Gentleman, I'm recognized. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment to the rule. I move the committee consider H.R. 4477 and H.R. 38 as standalone bills, granting each an open rule so that all members have the opportunity to offer amendments to this incredible bill on the floor. It is shameful that we are considering a rule that combines the text of a partisan NRA-sponsored bill with a bipartisan bill to provide much-needed updates to the national background check system. The Fix NICS bill will help close dangerous loopholes that have led to countless deaths, and we should do everything we can to advance the bill, not sabotage its chance of becoming law. And I ask for a yes vote. Thank you very much. You've now heard the uh, amendment offered. Is there a discussion? Seeing none, the vote will now be on solid amendment. Those favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no? No. Those have it, no have call, it. Gentleman asked now for a vote. <coughs> Clerk will poll the committee. Mr. Cole? No. Mr. Cole? No. Mr. Woodall? Mr. Burgess? No. Mr. Burgess? No. Mr. Collins? No. Mr. Collins? No. Mr. Byrne? No. Mr. Byrne? No. Mr. Newhouse? No. Mr. Buck? Ms. Cheney? No. Ms. Cheney? No. Ms. Slaughter? Yes. Ms. Slaughter? Aye. Mr. McGovern? Aye. Mr. McGovern? Aye. Mr. Hastings? Aye. Mr. Hastings? Aye. Mr. Polis? Mr. Chairman? No. Mr. Chairman? Clerk. 
Clerk will report total. Three yeas, six nays. The uh, amendments now. Excuse me, just a moment, please. Could you please tell me how Mr. Uh, uh, Newhouse. Newhouse from uh, Washington, State of Washington, is recorded on the slaughter amendment? Mr. Newhouse is not recorded. Okay. Does the gentleman wish to be recorded? Gentleman is requesting that he be recorded as a no vote on the slaughter amendment. Mr. Could Newhouse, the, no. Could the clerk please re provide the total? Thank you very three, much. Three yeas, seven nays. The, the amendment's not agreed to. Uh, further amendment or discussion? Yes, I have another amendment to the rule. I move the committee make in order and give the necessary waivers for the amendment to H.R. 38 by Representative Jackson Lee, number 19 which would prohibit a person from carrying a concealed firearm across state lines if the individual has been convicted of domestic violence or stalking. You've heard the amendment from the uh, gentlewoman, number 19 from the gentlewoman from Texas, Hugh Jackson Lee. Is there a discussion? Seeing none, the vote will now be on slaughter amendment. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. No. Those have it, those have it. Roll call, please. Gentlewoman, that's roll call vote. Clerk will poll the committee. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Woodall, Mr. Burgess, no. Mr. Burgess, no. Mr. Collins, no. Mr. Collins, no. Mr. Byrne, no. Mr. Byrne, no. Mr. Newhouse, no. Mr. Newhouse, no. Mr. Buck, Ms. Cheney, no. Ms. Cheney, no. Ms. Slaughter, aye. Ms. Slaughter, aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Mr. Hastings, aye. Mr. Hastings, aye. Mr. Polis, Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk will report. Three yeas, seven nays. The amendment is not agreed to, not agreed to, for the amendment or discussion. Mr. Chairman, from Massachusetts. I have an amendment to the rule. I move the committee make an order and give the necessary waivers for the bipartisan amendment to H.R. 38 by Representatives Moulton and Corbello, number 16, which would ban the manufacture, possession, or transfer of any part or combination of parts that is designed and functions to increase the rate of fire of a semi automatic rifle, such as bump stocks and similarly functioning uh, devices uh, of a different name. I would just say to my colleagues, um, you know, the uh, you know, kicking the can down the road or this, this meaningless study uh, that is in this bill doesn't suffice. Uh, too many people are dying in this country uh, as a result of this technology that uh, uh, turns these weapons into weapons of war, that turns them into machine guns, essentially. And, um, you know, and, and, I, and I've been critical of this institution because in the aftermath of massacres, all we do is have a moment of silence and we move on. Uh, well, today I'm, I'm critical because uh, what we're doing is actually putting forward legislation that will endanger my constituents. Uh, and uh, so I would hope that this amendment can be, be made in order so we can actually maybe do something positive. And with that, I urge a yes vote. Thank you very much for the discussion. Seeing down the vote, now be on the McGovern bill. Those five percent for saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. No. No, the no as for roll call. Call. Gentleman asked for roll call vote. Clerk will poll the committee. Mr. Cole. No. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Woodall, Mr. Burgess. No. Mr. Burgess, no. Mr. Collins. No. Mr. Collins, no. Mr. Byrne. No. Mr. Byrne, no. Mr. Newhouse. No. Mr. Newhouse, no. Mr. Buck, Ms. Cheney. No. Ms. Cheney, no. Ms. Slaughter. Aye. Ms. Slaughter, aye. Mr. McGovern. Aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Mr. Hastings. Aye. Mr. Hastings, aye. Mr. Polis. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk will report the total. Three yeas, seven Excuse eight. me just a moment, please. Excuse Could me. I ask how I'm recording? Excuse me. I'm sorry. I did not see you. Excuse me just a moment before we report. Could you please tell me how the gentleman from Georgia uh, is recorded? The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Woodall, is not recorded. If you could please uh, ask the gentleman. Mr. Woodall, no. Three yeas, eight nays. Uh, the amendment is not agreed to. Not agreed to for the amendment or discussion. Sitting down the vote now be on the motion from the gentleman from Oklahoma. Excuse me, just one, please. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I did not hear it. That is my my issue. The gentleman from Florida is recognized. Yes, sir. It would be an understatement, Mr. Chairman, for me uh, uh, to say that I'm not angry. I've been on this committee um, along with Ms. Lauder uh, and you for a protracted period of time. I don't know a day that I have been as disturbed uh, as I am uh, uh, today. Uh, and I've been angry at other times. But I, I, I really am uh, beside myself about what we're doing uh, uh, here. All of us know that this measure isn't going to become law. And Ms. Slaughter and Mr. McGovern have made it 
uh, abundantly clear, as have all of the members here, um, uh, that we have a lot of uh, work to do. Um, it's just, it, it's surreal uh, uh, to be in a setting like this um, and at the very same time uh, to have exacting responsibilities. In addition to ourselves, 25 of the members of the House of Representatives offered amendments uh, to this measure. Uh, none of them are made in order. I, uh, this is our agenda as published, and I ask unanimous consent that it be made a part of the record so as how I won't read all of the amendments to you or any of them. Without objection. At least have it understood um, uh, that um, uh, the parliamentarian, um, uh, the drafters of legislation, all of the people uh, have had to work. And here we come to the 54th closed rule. You've broken the record for the House of Representatives. And I, I, I just, on a measure of this consequence, it would seem to me that you'd stand up and be prepared um, uh, to vote um, if it's your conscience or uh, then vote your conscience. If it's your pocketbook, then vote your pocketbook, but at least give everybody else a chance. The amendment that I offer is one that was offered on that list of uh, the agenda that I just uh, put forward. Uh, uh, the number is uh, 20. The woman that uh, offered this amendment is a former police chief, and we have quite a number of sheriffs and police chiefs here on both sides uh, that this legislation, if it were to become law, is going to impact um, uh, the law enforcement community in a significantly negative way. Um, uh, this amendment to the rule, I move the committee make an order and give the necessary waivers for the amendment to H.R. 38 by Representative uh, Val Demings, um, as I indicated, number 20, which would strike the provision that would allow persons from other states to carry concealed weapons in school zones. That's the amendment, Mr. Chairman. I've got a question. Yes. Is there any state that allows anyone with a concealed weapon to carry in schools or school zones? Mr. Chairman, there are states that permit weapons at schools. Um, and Florida's legislature is prepared uh, to undertake. Excuse to me, I strike that. I, I, I meant uh, 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 not colleges. I meant uh, elementary, junior, and high school. Most so. of us have uh, gun-free zones. Most yes, of sir. us in most of our states have drug-free zones yes, around sir. our schools. Um, but um, I, I, I think Ms. Demings, um, as a former chief of police, really understood uh, the necessity for uh, this yes, sir. particular measure. Yes, sir. I, I, the, the word schools I took to mean not colleges. And I, I understand. I, 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 I well, there are, that. Florida also has a proposal before our legislature to allow school teachers at schools and yeah. other personnel at schools to carry yes, guns. Yes, Florida is getting just about as crazy as some of the rest of y'all's. Yes, sir. Well, it, it, we're reminding us that if it is against that state law, that person who would be offering the reciprocation would still have to follow the state law that they're in. Yeah, the problem so, that you have, Mr. Chairman, is once the person is in the area, we're acting as if all of them are caught. The idea is we're getting ready to let people carry concealed well, they, weapons, they, been, uh, whether they're caught or not. Yeah, well, they, they've, they been doing that, be. they've been doing that for years, but you're, I, I don't, I'm not trying, I was, I'm, I'm, you made a point back to me and I respect that. Is there well, further discussion? Well, the, some of the states that do, uh, Alabama, Arkansas, New Hampshire, Oregon, Rhode Island, Utah, uh, these all allow carrying concealed weapons in K through 12 zone. Wow, okay. Mm -hmm. Further discussion? Vote now be on the, uh, the amendment from the gentleman from Florida. Those in favor of the Hastings Amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. 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 I those have, those have a gentleman ask for roll call vote. Clerk will poll the committee. Mr. Cole. No. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Woodall. No. Mr. Woodall, no. Mr. Burgess.
Mr. Burgess, no. Mr. Collins, Mr. Collins, no. Mr. Byrne, no. Mr. Byrne, no. Mr. Newhouse, no. Mr. Newhouse, no. Mr. Buck, Ms. Cheney, no. Ms. Cheney, no. Ms. Slaughter, aye. Ms. Slaughter, aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Mr. Hastings, no. Mr. Hastings, aye. Mr. Polis, Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk will report the uh, total. Three A's, eight nays. The amendment's not agreed to, not agreed to. Further amendment or discussion? Okay. Seeing none, the vote now be on the motion from the gentleman, distinguished gentleman from Oklahoma. Those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. 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 Ayes have it, ayes have it. Okay. Gentleman asked, you. gentlewoman asked for roll call vote. Clerk will poll the committee. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mr. Collins. Mr. Collins. Aye. Mr. Byrne. Mr. Byrne, aye. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse, aye. Mr. Buck, Ms. Cheney. Aye. Ms. Cheney, aye. Ms. Slaughter. No. Ms. Slaughter, no. Mr. McGovern. No. Mr. McGovern, no. Mr. Hastings. No. Mr. Hastings, no. Mr. Polis, Mr. Chairman. Aye. Mr. Chairman, aye. Clerk report total. Eight yeas, three nays. The motion is agreed to. Accordingly, the gentleman, Mr. Collins from Georgia, the gentleman will be handling this for Republicans. Mr. Hastings for the Democrats. Mr. Hastings for Democrats. Uh, Judge, do you want to ask a question? Yeah. Uh, what damage are we going to do tomorrow, Mr. Chairman? Thank you very much. Tomorrow the uh, committee will be meeting at scheduled time at 3 o'clock. We're going to go to the CR tomorrow, knowing today was a time crunch. H.R. 3971, the Community Institution Mortgage Relief Act 2017, and H.R. 477, the Small Business Mergers Act, which is the Sales and Brokerage Simplification Act 2017. This completes our work for the day. Thank you very much.